this one. Okay, good afternoon. It's a great pleasure to be here. It's an honor to be on a panel with Tim and with David Walker, um, whose uh, work on fiscal sustainability I've been reading for, I, I wouldn't like to say how long. But so um, uh, now I'm going to keep this fairly simple. Jake was saying this morning that, that you have a problem in the US. You have a, a deficit of accounting journalists. Well, we have an excess of accounting journalists in the United Kingdom, but they have a sort of deficit of metaphors. Um, <laughs> The, the, how do I work this? The, um, there is basically only one metaphor that a journalist knows uh, to, um, to, to discuss uh, government finances and accounting issues, in my opinion, and that is the black hole. Um, now, I was a bit inspired to, to talk about this because NASA recently published this photograph of a black hole, and this is, uh, this is well, not exactly a photograph, but um, this is an image of a, fo of a black hole that was discovered in an unexpected part of space. Black holes are normally in the middle of galaxies. This one just happened to be wandering around by itself. Um, you see the characteristic red shift around it. And uh, this sort of stimulated me to think about all the unexpected places that we accountants find uh, uh, black, black holes. Um, now, th there's a black hole. Um, you see, the Americans don't really play the game on this. I mean, British journalists know perfectly well that you're meant to describe these, these sort of issues as, as, you know, black hole. That is the accepted metaphor. Um, Americans use a completely different astronomical uh, me metaphor. Um, but, but that's it. I mean, and, I, I, and I was struck. I was struck by actually the limited press coverage of, of this very important fiscal sustainability um, uh, statement, which I think this year for the first time was a full statement in, in the U.S. Uh, consolidated uh, accounts, um, which, I mean, other people will talk about it, but which shows some really w scary, deeply scary numbers. Um, uh, and yet all, all American journalists could come up with an eclipse. Now, uh, It's an honor. <laughs> this is also a new kid on the block, of course. There are two new kids on the block. Now, just to, just to prove my point, here are a couple of um, black holes. I've got a feeling one of these is an Ed Balls black hole, by the way. Um, um, and, and the one there with Andy Murray staring at it is, is in my view, a very cut price um, black hole. The two billion is about the amount of money the National Health Service spends in one week. So I don't think that's a... That's a terribly convincing black hole. Um, it's not just the newspapers, they get on the television as well. And we had our own. We had our very own uh, black hole. This, is, this was based on some work of the European uh, Court of Auditors that I was involved in. And I, I will run you through the numbers briefly, uh, shortly. But we found a huge, apparently, black hole in, in the Brussels budget. That was a bit scary. Um, but it gets much scarier if you take the Brexit, because it's not just journalists, it's also politicians. Here's George Osborne pointing out that if we decide to leave the EU, we'll have a 36 billion black hole equivalent to 8p on the basic rate of income tax. So it's a very widely used metaphor. And just to cap it, on my way here, flying through Heathrow, I found this on, on the front page of the, of the Financial Times. Um, this was particularly scary as I initially read the four as an in, and uh, you know, I, was, I had a connected flight at Heathrow. Um, so that's quite a scary headline. Uh, and there's a second uh, black hole story in there, which is, which is talking about the, you know, the growth in debt in, in China, which is uh, actually fundamentally rather more scary than, than the Heathrow one, but uh, that's not the way the, um, the FT got its head, headlines around. Um, I'll just add to this, um, I, was puzzled, I was reading around about the relationship between real black holes and financial black holes, and I came across this. It, it's got of no value to my presentation except this. For all the accountants in the audience, you will understand that the whole universe is based on double entry bookkeeping. <laughs> and this, this, I think, is, is rather useful. Um, now, back on Earth, uh, I mean, other people have said, you know, these, the deficits we worry about tend to be about stops and flows. 
how much do you owe, what, what are you getting in? And um, you know, we had a discussion this morning, is it necessarily a, an, an enormous problem if, you, if you've got a negative net worth? I don't think it, it necessarily is. I think what matters probably is the direction of travel, and really what matters is that, uh, that what you have is uh, sustainable in, in the long run. So it, it, it's in the terms of the transition that we had in the European Union 10 years ago from moving from uh, modified accruals accounts, basically cash accounts, to full accruals, that it struck home to me just how important it is to have sustainability information. Um, because I think people's first, first uh, response to uh, seeing negative net worth on government statements is they're, they're alarmed. And then they get used to it. And I think you can't really, you, you, people shouldn't get too, uh, too alarmed, but they shouldn't just take any deficit as being just the same as, uh, as the last one. So, you know, there are times when, when black holes need to be, be signaled. Um, if, I, if I talk very briefly about our black hole, I think, I think this sort of, um, this, this was the basis for the story. You know, we had commitments, we had, uh, the European Commission had made some promises, some pledges that it was going to make some expenditure in the future. It had liabilities which were not necessarily linked to those budgetary decisions but arose from things it had already done, like employ people, like having a few nuclear reactors. These, these were generating liabilities um, autonomously, if you like, and it has uh, a revenue constraint. Um, I don't want to exaggerate the problem. This is um, EU spending per member state uh, as a percentage of GDP on the... Um, on the far side of, of the diagram, and on the multicolored side, you have it as a share of general government expenditure. You'll see, in overall, it's about 1% uh, of uh, GDP, and, and it's about 2% of general government expenditure. Although in places like Bulgaria, the annual spend amounts to more than 15% of general government expenditure, so quite, quite uh, substantial sums. Um, but, but overall, not so big, and. I won't, with the time left, I won't try and go through the numbers, but essentially there were a stock of things that need to be paid in the future. Um, there is a continuing flow of new, new commitments to, to make money, and the revenue constraint is, is, really, um, is really fixed, 1.23% of GNI. You, if you go above that, you're in trouble. Um, you, you can't ask for that money. Uh, so this, this, I think, really makes the case for the European Union itself producing some kind of sustainability statement and making sure um, that it's in the future going to be able to meet the payment needs. Um, and I think the important thing there is, is to put it forward as, um, uh, as, as cash flows. Uh, as I say, again, not to exaggerate the problem, these are the people who have some pledges to, uh, to cash in on. Um, Romania, it's more than 25% of their general government expenditure. They're not actually going to spend that in, in a very short time. That, that would take them some years to achieve. Um, so, so I think there's a big role for sustainability uh, statements. But I, I do think that we need to bear in mind that there's a limit to what you can, you can get out of uh, accounting statements. They don't tell you about the future. Um, I think it's true that some of the mem EU member states have suffered because of poor accounting data, uh, but revenue shocks right at the top of the list. This is, this is what happened to the UK housing market, and if you think about all the taxes which are generated by the housing market, you see a decline like that, you're, you're really in trouble. Um, your tax base can also move abroad sometimes, that's Panama. Um, demographics are definitely something that we have to look at, some scary demographics here. Um, and yes, they have to be built into to fiscal sustainability. Um, natural disasters happen, huge impact. And as we're in, in LA, this is what happens if global warming gets out of hand. We, we'd be on an island, I think. Um, so it, it's, uh, it's, to my mind, it's very important that we have accruals accounts. It's very important that we have fiscal sustainability statements. When we have long-term fiscal sustainability statements, as in the US, I think we need to be thinking about the things which are not present in the accounting records, but which are, could really seriously have an impact on government revenues in the future, demographics, 
climate change, whatever. As we're not far from Hollywood, we're finished with the Hollywood image, um, I couldn't really come, out, come up with a happy ending for this. I, I'm struck by when I thought about all the things which might affect uh, fiscal sustainability, they all seem to be on, on, on the downside. Um, but of course, if we can get back in Europe to a sustained period of economic growth and of moderate in inflation, not excessive inflation, but as moderate inflation, we, we could certainly grow ourselves out of, out of the problems. I mean, uh, and the challenge is, 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 I think, essentially to get ourselves in a position where we can do that. Thank you very much.